So my talk is Fetching Moths from the Works, Correctness Methods in Software, or an investigation into the nature of software with particular concern toward its effective construction, or why do computers fail and what can be done about it? So that's actually based on one of my very favorite academic papers um, by Jim Gray, written in 1986, what do computers, or why do computers stop and what can be done about it? Um, Jim Gray was a researcher at Tandem and he was writing about the tandem nonstop. So the tandem nonstop was a thing that you could uh, uh, take a shotgun to and it would still keep running. It was fully redundant hardware, things like that, and uh, they promised you know, massive uptime. But they found in practice that uh, customers were still having their tandem nonstops stop. So Jim Gray started to dig into why that was. Um, and he said of the hardware, the resulting systems have hardware mean time between failures measured in decades or centuries. So the hardware was really solid. Unfortunately, it says nothing about the major sources of failure in the systems, which is software. So that's kind of the unfortunate uh, place we find ourselves in right now. If we want to make reliable things, we can make really fantastic hardware. We have all the mathematics, we have all the uh, engineering expertise to do that in hardware. Um, but software is kind of a hard shit show right now. Um, so there are these three examples that I really like of our software practices failing us. Um, and the, the first is design failures, and the doors open up in the design failures, and it's kind of near and dear to my heart because the doors are the actual doors of the BART system. Um, there is a computer that controls the doors, and that computer uh, had a specification problem. So if the train goes too fast, uh, past a certain point in the station, it will um, tend to open up its doors while it's in the Transbay tube. Now, if you've never taken the BART, the Transbay tube is a long underwater subway. Uh, the train is going about 50 miles an hour, and the doors just come open. This was a recognized problem, and there's a really excellent paper uh, called The Case of the Three Engineers versus BART. Three engineers analyzed the BART system and recognized that uh, this would happen, and they were fired when they went to the BART for causing trouble. Um, so the, this is an IEEE paper. It's a really interesting um, discussion of the ethics around engineering, but it's, it's also about organizations and how organizations kind of um, influence what a technical system can accomplish. Um, agile iteration takes to the sky. So this is the F-18, it's the, the little white fellow there. Uh, at this point, it was a prototype. Now, the problem in this example is not that the hardware was wrong, it's that the software to control the hardware was too limited. So during testing, um, one of these things went out of control, and the pilot was unable to get it back into control, so he had to eject and the prototype was lost. It turns out that the flight hardware could have uh, been recoverable except for the specification of the uh, avionics system disallowed movement of the control flaps so that the pilot couldn't accidentally damage them. Um, so, the <laughs> right? So this is a place where the requirements of the system uh, don't meet the reality of the system. So someone in the thinking of this thought, okay, well, if we move past a certain degree, then the control flap will break off, so just never move past that degree. But because of material science advances, it, it could. Um, and there's a really excellent discussion of this. It was a big, big deal in the early 80s because it was a software problem. The F-18 was one of the first um, not Apollo spacecraft fly-by-wire uh, systems, and so there was a lot of interest in the software community at the time. And when this thing crashed, people were really curious about why that happened. Um, so SigSoft is, uh, in the early 80s, incredible. And I suggest you pay the 20 bucks a year, whatever it is, so that you can go back and read through the archive. But uh, there's an entire front letter kind of written in this irreverent style uh, describing why this F-18 crashed. And the, the last one is actually my favorite um, a bug affects the staging prototype. Uh, this particular staging prototype happens to be several hundred tons of liquid hydrogen and oxygen and an orbiter. Uh, so in this orbiter, there are actually four computers that are the main avionics computers, and they're asynchronous. They're uh, priority-driven real-time systems, and there's a backup. So the idea of the backup was that if the main system suffered some sort of software fault, um, they could then fail over to the backup because the space shuttle is meant to be uh, 
something that you can recover from. You don't end up being entombed in it when the computers fail. It turns out that backup system, as discussed in the bug heard around how, the bug heard around the world, it turns out that that backup system had a synchronization problem on boot. So there was an interface discrepancy, basically. So the asynchronous system was meant to fail over to a synchronous system. Um, this is a, a problem with the interface, but it's also a problem with the requirements. Um, requirements generally only specify the positive things that need to happen. System must do this, system must do that, and very rarely the negative things. Um, and this was also a problem with testing, because there had rarely been a, a case uh, where they had tested this failover. Of course it was tested, but it turns out that the sync problem only occurs with a relatively low probability, and it just so happened that that uh, low probability struck on the very first flight of the space shuttle. So everybody was suited up, they were waiting to go, and they turned the thing on, and it wouldn't turn on. So in, in this paper, um, maintaining software systems in the field, absorbing large changes or, an, or additions in the middle of the development cycles, Reconfiguring software systems to fit never quite identical vehicles or missions are our real problems today. So there was a lot of work at this time on formalization, how do you make uh, correct systems, but very little um, interaction with actual practitioners. So here we have an actual practitioner working on a spacecraft saying, really my main problems are not figuring out um, if my formal specification of a stack are correct, but how to adapt to changes in a spacecraft. And so that was in the 1970s, and there's been a lot of work in this area. Uh, have we actually made progress? And the answer is that, yes, we have. Sorta, we've, we've made progress. Um, it, it turns out we've learned over time that correct is not actually a state. You can't actually say that this software is now correct. It's a goal for software. It's a thing that you have to get to. And what's needed, really, if you're going to achieve correctness, which is something that you could never fully achieve, but you can get on down the road toward it, um, we need to have an understanding of how we fail to achieve that state. And so there's this really excellent paper by Robin Lutz, and she'll show up a couple more times in this talk, called Analyzing Software Requirement Errors in Safety Critical, Critical Embedded Systems. Um, the embedded systems she's talking about are actually the Voyager and the Galileo spacecraft, and they obsessively tracked the uh, software development process so they knew when there was an error, and they could sort of root cause analyze the errors. Um, and she says this in the paper that few internal faults were uncovered during integration and systems testing. So internal faults are things like logic errors or bugs that programmers make, just tiny little mistakes. And there were very few of these. It turns out that human review is actually very good at catching these things. Uh, but functional faults are the most com common kind of software error in the system. So these are requirements problems. These are interface problems between software and hardware. It turns out that that is mostly where um, the failures were occurring. And the problem is that for so long, so many of the formal methods that came, were coming out are to do with internal failures because there was a misunderstanding of where software errors actually occur in practice. So the research was focused wrong. So what kind of software faults are there? If it turns out that there are these like gradients of software faults, and Lutz kind of breaks it down. She says that there are program faults with our internal mistakes, interface violations, functional violations, but you can kind of boil that down and just say bugs. That's the kind of shorthand that we use when we say bugs. There are also human errors, so people not communicating effectively, misunderstanding the spec, mishandling of the specification, things like that. These are communication problems. Like you can boil it down to just communication problems. And process error, so we don't test enough. Um, we don't have adequate specs. We don't know all the things that we need to know. These are just organization goofs. So you can kind of boil these very finely detailed software faults into three general categories. And each one of those, if you're going to build a correct system, is something that you ha actually have to actively work toward. And correct itself breaks down into two sub-goals, which helps guide you. So one is validation. And you can kind of think of validation uh, as being represented by the question, are we building the right product? And then there's verification, is, which breaks down into the question, are we building the product right? So is this thing that we are building what we mean it to be, what we need it to be, and does it in fact do that thing that we think that it should? So if you're going to try and build software like this, what steps can we take today? Like, how, how do we take our advanced understanding of all the potential fuck-ups we can make and turn it into something that we can actually do in practice. So there are a bunch of steps. 
right? Step zero is to convince your organization to invest. Th this is not a cheap thing to do. Um, and there's this excellent paper uh, that I, I sort of keep carbon copying out to project managers called uh, Eliminating Embedded Software Defects Prior to Integration Testing. Uh, and it overviews some of the present techniques, and it kind of has its own pitch for what technique you should take, which I don't necessarily agree with the conclusion there. Um, but the, the best part is this entire section on the economics of software failure. And the author says that the more faults that pass undetected into integration test and beyond, the more the project will cost and the longer it will take to complete. So a project manager usually cares about cost, and project manager usually cares about hitting the schedule. So that particular section of this paper is fantastic. So that's a great way of getting your organization involved because it's a process. It's something where you have to uh, learn techniques yourself and you have to teach techniques to all of your coworkers. And everybody has to be on board. Past that, step one, aim to make the systems both safe and reliable. So these are two distinct things, safety and reliability. Safety is in the event of failure, that the failures are not catastrophic, that th people don't get injured, that things don't blow up. Uh, and reliable means simply that the failures that will occur are well known. You know what failures will happen in practice. Um, and Nancy Levison has a relatively recent book, uh, Engineering a Safer World, Systems Thinking Applied to Safety. Systems thinking is not something that we see a lot in software, even though we work with these complex systems. Um, Systems thinking uh, really got its start during the Apollo project. Uh, in the 1950s, it was not uncommon to strap brave airmen onto the top of nuclear rockets and then launch them out of the atmosphere. Uh, but then when we got a little more interested in touching other foreign bodies, we needed bigger systems. And those bigger systems are hard to manage. So um, systems thinking allows you to think holistically uh, about an organization, about the technical product that it's creating, and about the failures that are inevitable. It's actually mostly centered around failures. And engineering a safety, safer world um, is really excellent because it has a failure model that's not predicated on uh, industrial revolution assumptions. So most systems thinking assumes implicitly that components wear down over time, which is not the case in software. Nothing wears down over time. But that influences the way that you think about faults. So I highly recommend everyone read this book. Step two, be clear on what your system must do and what it mustn't do. So this goes back to negative specifications. So if the specification here was for Buster Keaton, get into the car, um, he has achieved that by the bottom right-hand corner there, but he's done it by standing on top of the building and then riding a rail arm all the way down. Um, if you can imagine if you have a specification that simply says, Software must do this, software must do that, software must do this. You can have multiple systems that each meet those positive needs, but then they differ in their negative criteria. They differ in the uh, implicit negative criteria. And so they don't behave reliably because you can't tell in what ways they'll fail. Um, and Nancy Levison uh, has this really excellent paper, The Role of Software in Spacecraft Accidents. Um, and it's very good because it gets down into root causes of why these software failures happened. It's not just sort of like, well, there was this bit that we didn't toggle. And those are important, but the root causes tend to be organization problems. They tend to be um, failures with testing. They tend to be failures with communicating requirements changes or hardware changes to software engineers. And software specifications often describe nominal behavior well, but are very incomplete with respect to required software behaviors under excuse me, off nominal conditions, meaning people don't specify negative things. And most safety-related requirements are best described using design constraints. So if you're going to build these safe systems, you really don't want to say software must do this, must do that. You want to say can't, shouldn't, because then that will tell you where your actual boundaries are rather than where you can play. Step three, we don't want nobody that nobody sent. So again, going back to the role of software and. Uh, in spacecraft accidents, it is widely believed that because software has executed safely in other applications, it will be safe in the new one. Most accidents involve software that is doing exactly what it was designed to do, but it reliably performs the wrong function. So how many times have you installed a library into your, uh, your system, and the library 
behaves in a really strange way. And you think, well, this is garbage. This thing doesn't work. It probably did work. It just worked in a different context. So all software uh, fits into some implicit context, right? And that implicit context may or may not be the one that you're working with. And if it's not the one that you're working with, it might be totally divergent, in which case it will fail immediately, or what's worse is they might be slightly overlapping. So it will seem to work in test, but maybe it won't work out in practice. Um, and the interesting conclusion of this paper is that software reuse is something that we attempted for, or not the total conclusion, but part conclusion, is that software reuse is a thing that we attempted for 20 years or so, but we really ought to back out of it. Like, we haven't, we haven't quite made it yet. And it has recommendations for how um, we could make software re reuse a extre an extremely reliable thing. Step four, audit and review all code, aid with automated tests. So if you're going to reuse a library, you have to uh, understand what it is that that library actually does. Simply stated documentation won't necessarily tell you, um, which God love us, there's usually not documentation, uh, but often the documentation can be wrong or it can be incomplete or it can be jamming on an implicit context that we don't necessarily understand. We can misinterpret it. And there are actually three different things that I would suggest you read with regard to this. Uh, the OpenBSD culture was a presentation that was given in 2006, and it describes the way that the OpenBSD project goes about building its software. It's a very safety-focused operating system. Um, it's not necessarily the nicest culture, but its culture of review and technical excellence is impeccable. Um, going fast slowly uh, is a 2016 uh, blog post about the Varnish cache. So they're very interested in performance and they're very interested in correctness. And sort of how did they do that? And this, this uh, blog post actually notes that they have something like five times um, the amount of test source code that they do uh, the amount of varnish code. And uh, they each write about five lines of code a day, if you sort of break it down. That's, that's basically all they can get, which is about on par with um, safety critical systems, about the same speed of development. And then an additional one is how SQLite is tested. So SQLite is fascinating because it does one particular complicated thing, and it's meant to be portable to multiple systems and work with unreliable compilers. And so how do you sort of achieve that? How do you achieve something that is um, reliable in the face of complete uncertainty? Um, and HIP, I'm, I believe it's HIP that wrote this, I credited him with it, um, sort of goes through the testing methodology that he uses for SQLite to the, to the point where he doesn't even um, necessarily care about the compiler, only the code that the compiler produces. It's, it's, it's a fascinating read. So step five, use randomized testing and track coverage. Uh, so randomized testing forces you to do, th or allows for three things. First, it forces you to define what valid data is. So there's randomized testing that's just complete craziness where it is literally just random streams of data. And I don't mean that. What I mean is uh, random generation of data that's valid in your domain. So the, the thing that's important here is that if you are forced to declare what valid is, you have to know what valid is. You can't just think you know it. And because you now have these random instances of data, uh, the inputs can sort of creep into code paths that you might necessarily, might not necessarily have thought up. So um, the human brain is great at pattern matching, and unfortunately, we're really great through that pattern matching of convincing ourselves that we thought of all of the cases. And randomized testing sort of helps us paper over that cognitive defect. Um, now, what happens is that when you're creeping through in this random walk, you'll find sometimes that the system that you think you're working with is not actually the system that the specification requires, or maybe the flip. So it ends up being this large feedback loop of are the requirements wrong? Is my model wrong? Is the system under test wrong? And you sort of end up driving correctness much better. Um, and because you have these, uh, you have uh, randomly generated valid data, you get thousands and thousands and thousands of test cases for free. So if you think about unit testing where you sort of have to ad hoc, build your data up, test, build your data up, test, that's all for free. So an evaluation of randomized testing is when people first proposed randomized testing, um, the response was, that's hot garbage. Uh, and then someone actually went to empirically measure it. So there were all these ideas about testing uh, in the 80s. The, the, at the time that this paper was written, the uh, 
one that people were most excited about was uh, equivalence partition testing. So you sort of take your domain and you def define where the inputs are equivalent. So you can take a representative of these equivalent domains and then put them through the system. It turns out that that works really well when what you're testing is addition, because we can sort of cognitively understand where things are equivalent. And it gets much more difficult when you have, say, a binary tree or something like that. Um, this paper compares randomized uh, generation of data versus uh, equivalent partition testing and discovers actually that randomized testing um, is much faster to do and catches more defects uh, while being faster to run as well. So our experiments have shown that random testing can discover some relatively subtle errors without a great deal of effort. It's a very reserved paper, um, and that is, the, that is the most emotional it gets. <laughs> and kind of the most famous paper um, is QuickCheck, a lightweight tool for randomized testing of Haskell programs. And it's really focused on the particular Haskell library, but the, the last section uh, of the paper is suitable for general um, uh, randomized testing, sort of how does it work, how would you conceive of how it would work, and um, even if you don't care about Haskell, just read the last section of the paper and then go through the bibliography. So step six, be willing to change your approach. Some things, it turns out, don't actually work in practice. They don't make sense. Um, and Nancy Levison has a paper, an experimental evaluation of the assumption of independence in multi-version programming. So uh, that that uh, mouthful of a title is really about the multiple computers that were in the space shuttle. It was thought in the 1970s, it was state of the art, that if you had a formal specification, you could have multiple groups implement that specification, and then your computers could vote. And what would happen is group A and group B would inevitably uh, insert defects into their software, but they would make independent uh, faults. Um, it turns out that in practice, that's not the case. Humans tend to eat, all have the uh, same cognitive flaws. So we tend to make um, software errors that are not independent of one another. Uh, so it turns out that even though this seems like a good idea, in practice, it is very expensive. Uh, it tends to cause more faults in the system because you have uh, more complicated things going on and it takes more time. So it is literally worse in every possible uh, the way that you could think of. <laughs> so step seven, use tools that are amenable to formal methods. So right now we just kinda, we kinda wing it in a lot of cases. And we kinda wing it in a lot of cases um, because the, the defects that we sort of get ourselves into aren't so bad. Um, but in some cases, they are. Uh, when we're dealing with a lot of money, uh, when we're dealing with hardware devices, when we're dealing with spacecraft. So there are two really excellent books that kind of sit at two opposite spectrums. And the first is kind of the math mathematical basis of formal methods. And it's called Rigorous Software Development and Introduction to Program Verification. It's not a fast book. It's not a book that you'll read on an airplane. It's something where you sit down and you just sort of grind through it. But it teaches you all of the, the, the basic assumptions that academics working in formal verification will just sort of have implicitly baked into their minds. And on the other side, building high integrity applications with Spark. So Spark is actually an ADA variant, um, which if any of you worked for the Department of Defense in the 1980s, you know ADA. Um, <laughs> so Spark is ADA with all of the ambiguity removed, which allows you to apply formal proof tools to the generated code. So you can uh, build as close to as possible perfect code, assuming that your specification is not wrong. So step nine, use formal methods. And I admit that this is, is kind of a leap. It uh, requires you to uh, invest a lot of time in study, a lot of money, and you have to sort of pitch it to the organization. And there are a lot of minefields to step on. So formal specification and documentation with Z, a case with Z, I should say, a case study approach. So Z is a formal specification tool that allows you to uh, generate specifications for requirements that have no ambiguities so that everyone can agree and then everyone can uh, implement the same thing. Because most software defects occur somewhere around the specification part. Uh, one of the co-inventors of Z was quoted as saying, it has turned out that the world just does not suffer significantly from the kind of problem that our research was originally intended to solve. <laughs> so Zed is close in some sense. Um, and 
I highly recommend reading this book simply because it's so clear-eyed. It doesn't try to paper over the defects. It sort of walks you through specifying things and then says, yeah, this, this kind of sucks. Like, this doesn't work, or if you were to extend it in this way, you would break the model. And it's fantastic for that. But there's kind of a new way of introducing formal methods, um, and exemplified by moving fast with software verification, which is a paper out of Facebook. Um, there's now the application of formal tooling, in this case, the infer static analyzer. There's, there's the addition of formal tooling into ad hoc environments. So instead of saying upfront everything is formal, you say, okay, well, we have this thing already and we can't stop it. What can we apply to make it better? So you introduce formal tools that sort of guide people, or you guide them to use better languages. Um, and that seems to be the model where academic research is going now. How can we make what we have better, rather than the 80s where it was, how can we reinvent everything? So step nine, build simple. So it is possible to make a thing that's so complicated it can't fit into your mind. Um, and there's a really excellent paper written in 2006, it's about 66 pages, but it reads real fast, called Out of the Tar Pit, um, which argues for a method of separating essential complexity, so the problem domain, um, from accidental complexity, the things that just sort of are inflicted on us by us, um, using system design, using um, like how uh, relational databases are structured, how, um, telephone systems are structured to sort of guide us into something that separates those out. Um, people that uh, proposed the microservices architecture took a lot of inspiration from out of the tar pit. Um, the other book that I would recommend for building it simple is Normal Accidents, Living with High-Risk Technologies. And if you've ever seen me talk anywhere else, I, I pretty much always bring this book out. Um, it, it is a book that discusses um, accidents that are inherent to systems. So not accidents that you just didn't think about, but accidents that will inevitably happen. So if you have a boil water reactor, inevitably you will stop cooling it because maybe humanity dies out and then it will blow up. That is an accident that is inherent to it. Um, and you can have something like that in a software system. So if you have something that spends money very quickly, but doesn't have the ability to necessarily know what money is being spent, uh, at some point it will just sort of run off the rails and spend as much money as it can. Um, there, was, there used to be an investment house called Knight Capital Group that had that exact problem happen to them. Um, they killed themselves with a software bug. Um, systems accidents will get you every time. Step 10, build for failure. So even when you start uh, adding in all these formal methods and you start reasoning more effectively and testing more effectively, failures still will happen. Some of them are inherent, some of them are accidental because you don't think through things. Um, like maybe a train rolls on through your house. So there are two papers uh, that I highly recommend. One is Crash Only Software. Uh, it's out of Google, and it's about uh, how they structure systems to simply fail when a fault occurs inside of the program, and then how they store state to disk and things like that so that it can then be restarted and start processing traffic again. Um, very short paper, very clear. The other one is Making Reliable Distributed Systems in the Presence of Software Errors by Joe Armstrong. So these are actually both written in the same year in 2003, and they both basically take the same approach, um, except crash-only software is clearly uh, influenced by C++ and Java, which were the prevalent languages in Google at the time, um, and this paper is Airline. It is about the design of Airline and what uh, drove the Ericsson crew designing Airline what drove their thinking. Um, highly recommended. You can, if you only care about the design of systems, you can skip the section two, I think is the section that describes the Erlang sequential and concurrent programming languages, and you won't miss uh, anything other than learning um, Erlang. And the thing that I think is most interesting about this paper is that we assume that such programs do contain errors and investigate methods for building reliable systems despite such errors. So this is kind of a watershed because so many formal methods assume that you can get rid of software errors and then just kind of paper over it up to the fact. You can look at Erlang as a formal method because it, it restricts certain classes of errors that can exist. You can look at type systems as formal methods because they restrict certain errors that can exist. But the, the fantastic thing about fault-tolerant software is it just assumes that accidents will happen. Um, so if we want to build correct systems, you know, what, what is it that we must invent? Where do we sit right now in terms of practical application and research? Um, 
first off, formal specification needs a tool that a project manager can love. We have so many errors that come because of requirements documents not being correct. Either they're not correct because they don't model reality, or they're not correct because people don't read them correctly, but software errors exist in specification. And the closest thing we've got to satisfying this is Zed, and uh, I'm pretty sure you could make project managers cry with Zed, because it's really hard, even as someone with mathematics and computer science background, to understand Zed. It takes a lot of study. So we basically don't have that. We need effective system modeling tools. Um, so these are, if you've ever seen UML diagrams, that's the domain that it's meant to address. Um, if you've ever worked with UML diagrams, you understand the problem there. You really can't effectively model systems with them. Uh, we need methods for the effective analysis of running systems. Question. We are six minutes over, and it's up here so you'd be finished, but I wanted to check in. How long is longer? Oh, I'm almost done. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so we need methods for the effective analysis of running systems. We don't know what most systems are doing. If you work um, with D-trace probes or things like that, you have some insight, but those aren't commonly used, so we need those. But most, we need a techno-political culture of excellence. We, we just sort of kind of assume, eh, close enough is, is the, the, the method that is effective, but it's really not. Um, and you can see some groups have excellence at their core, like the OpenBSD project or things like that, but we really don't have that generally. And so what can we study if we need to build tools how do we, how do we like, learn from the past? And there's actually lots that we can study. We can study the works of Tony Hoare. Um, so communicating sequential processes, um, the axiomatic basis for programming languages. Tony Hoare, has, has, he won the Turing Award in the 1980s, and his work since, I think, should probably get him another Turing Award, but they don't do that. Um, we can study the Apollo project. So there's a lot of documentation about how the Apollo project, it was basically a research project that was carried out in nine years. So how in nine years do you go from um, monkey on the top of a nuclear rocket to landing on the moon? How do you do it? Um, and it turns out that there's a lot of uh, historical documentation on that. And it, it's, it's fascinating if you're going to step into a half research project. Um, study disasters. So this is the Deepwater Horizon. Um, the Deepwater Horizon study group put out a lot of documentation on what the organization failures were, what the technical failures were, and you can kind of get a sense, you can see where your organization will uh, carry over in, in some sense. And then study the Industrial Revolution. So right now in software, we're basically at the early stage of the Industrial Revolution, where steam boilers blow up, and we don't know because we don't have an understanding of metal. Um, software fails, and it fails, and we just sort of go, well, that's how software works. But I don't think it has to be. So how, how does technology change culture? How does culture change technology? Is really what we can learn through studying the Industrial Revolution. Um, and that is the end. <laughs>